Okay, so this is a talk about the OSIRIS Rex space mission, which flew out to asteroid Bennu, which I thought was a rather interesting topic to uh, have a look at. It's been in the news uh, just recently as well, which was uh, part of the motivation. Now, it's one of a class of what we call sample return missions. So I thought I'd say a few words about other sample return missions just to set the background beforehand. The idea is to collect bits of material from space that have not yet been corrupted and um, changed by uh, landing on Earth and then being picked up. We obviously have quite a lot of meteorite material, but it's always been contaminated by uh, even a short period spent on the Earth. And so we can never be entirely sure um, that it's in sort of pristine and unmodified condition. So the idea has been for a while to collect uh, the pristine material as its uh, origin has always been since perhaps the uh, formation of the solar system even. So some of the oldest material we'll ever get our hands on. And the earliest attempts to do that were with balloons, um, trying to catch the material as it was falling into the Earth's atmosphere. But before it had really entered the, uh, the zone in which all the weather happens down in the bottom, in the troposphere, in the bottom 5,000 feet or so. And the idea is that uh, fragments of space rock, bits of dust from comets, etc., all fall into the atmosphere all the time. It adds up, in fact, to about 100 tonnes a day. So 40,000 tonnes of this stuff every year falling into the Earth's atmosphere. And you could send a, a balloon up to terrific height, two or 300,000 feet, and try to then catch the dust and the material as it was gently falling down in the thin atmosphere. Um, and you can see that in the picture here, they've got a um, gantry vehicle set up to launch the balloon and the payload on the gondola at the bottom. And then in the uh, inset, the part of the gondola there that looks like some sort of bizarre foghorn, but is in fact a giant um, a vacuum cleaner. So basically they would go up as high as they could in the balloon and then start the vacuum cleaner and suck material through and catch any dust in a filter. And you can see some of the dusts of gr and grains that they did catch, which were very successful because they were indeed uh, very, very ancient indeed. And I think the oldest fragment that we've managed to catch by this sort of method is around 7 billion years old since it was last molten, which is terrific because it's even older than the sun, uh, which is 5 billion years old. So this was material that last was melted in some previous uh, supernova explosion that scattered it. Um, and then it uh, ended up as part of the builder's material for the solar system, but never got uh, made into any part of any other object. So some of the uh, most pristine material you could ever get. Now other attempts have been made. Um, and this is uh, the Genesis probe, which was sent out into space. And you can see uh, in the bottom right picture, it looks like a, uh, a collection of frying pans with some solar panels attached. The idea was these, these panels would open up and they contain the sort of honeycomb catcher material made out of a gel so that it would fly through space and capture particles uh, perhaps from the solar wind emanating from the sun but also anything else that came its way by way of uh, interplanetary dust and then the idea was that it would do that for a while then all close up again and then parachute down and uh, land safely back on the Earth and be recovered and taken to the lab and the dishes opened and examined. But unfortunately, as you can see in the, the text on the screen there, the parachute didn't open properly. 
And the idea was they were going to catch the parachute with a, a helicopter with a hook on it. So that as it was coming down, they would capture the, um, uh, the parachute and even prevent the uh, whole container reaching the ground. So keen were they to keep it from acquiring any earthbound dust. Unfortunately, uh, the parachute didn't open properly and it plummeted into the desert um, and burst itself open on impact uh, or almost completely ruining the samples. They did get some useful bits out of it. Another one was the Stardust mission, which was actually a mission to uh, collect material from a comet. It's a silly name, Stardust. If you're collecting Stardust, you're collecting Stardust, but it's, it was collecting comet dust, this one. Fair enough, it would have collected other material on the way. And the idea, again, was to fly through the coma, the uh, material surrounding the nucleus. Um, so comets consist of a dense nucleus surrounded by the, the coma of material boiling off it and then, then the thinner tail material left behind. So they were going to fly through and try and get samples of the coma of Comet Wild. And that was launched back in 1999 and was one of the fastest uh, spacecraft uh, up to that point. So it's been exceeded now by um, uh, the New Horizons probe. So there it is being launched and so that's a sort of cutaway of the uh, launch vehicle and the Stardust spacecraft being deployed out of the, the, uh, uh, the top stage there and sent off to go and chase down Comet Wild. And so it had a, a, quite an interesting journey to catch up with Comet Wild. You can see it was launched from Earth and did in fact three loops. You can just about make that out. Um, the green, the red, and there's a blue loop that's almost the same as the green there. Um, and on each uh, loop it opened up and collected some interstellar dust or interplanetary dust, it should really be called here, um, but eventually then caught up with the comet. And it used those flybys of the Earth to do the gravity assist manoeuvre, where you fly past behind the Earth and because the Earth is moving away from you relative to the trajectory, it drags you forward and accelerates you each time. So you pick up some more speed. And that was how it was managed to uh, go and catch up with a rather fast moving comet. There's a picture that it took of the comet nucleus. And it looks like a dirty snowball, quite dark in colour and has that sort of soft cratered appearance on it which is typical of a sort of snowball material. It doesn't have sharply defined craters. And the return samples were brought back uh, five years ago, just over in uh, 2015, January. And uh, very useful analysis of the material of the comet. We were able to confirm all sorts of things, such as the isotope ratio of the water in the ices to try to figure out whether these comets could have been the source of the water in the Earth's oceans in the comets might have rained down on Earth uh, because they contain a lot of water, thus delivering the, the water oceans. So uh, uh, just another couple of words about Comet Wild. It's got a rather curious orbit. It's called a Jupiter family comet, this one. Its orbit ranges from uh, 1.6 astronomical units, so uh, roughly uh, the orbit of Mars out to 5.3, which uh, 5 AU is the uh, orbital distance of Jupiter, hence the name. And uh, its orbit got dramatically changed in 1974 by a bit of a near miss with Jupiter, which has then pulled it into this short six year long orbit. Um, so showing how Jupiter tends to grab comets as they fly by and then bring them under its control. It's quite an interesting process. Here's a picture of the sample collector on it. Again, lots of these little cells. It uh, looks like an ice cube tray, doesn't it? But they contained this uh, very, very lightweight, soft material called aerogel. 
Um, so the, the problem is that the interplanetary dust will hit the uh, collector with quite a high velocity. Everything in space tends to be whizzing around. Uh, it's necessary for it to do that, or it would uh, fall into the sun under gravity. So it's got at least the orbital velocity of its uh, distance from the sun to deal with. And so the aerogel is quite good at catching the particles and uh, not uh, superheating them and vaporizing them when they uh, get uh, slowed down to the speed of the spacecraft. So in 2006, the uh, capsule separated and came down to Earth. Re-entry at 13 kilometers per second, of course, this orbital velocity problem again. And the heat shield heated up and the parachute opened this time and it was collected from the desert. So here it is on the floor back on Earth intact. So actually it worked really rather well and we got some nice samples from it. And some are indeed of these were five billion years old, older than the Earth. And you can see there a sort of section through the aerogel where the particles have come in from the left with quite high velocity and been slowed and trapped within it without being wrecked. Now the Japanese have also had a couple of goes at this uh, sample return mission. There's been the Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 space missions 10 years apart. 2010 and uh, just this year in 2020, um, we'll get the second one back. And the first one went to visit the sort of peanut shaped asteroid Itokawa. And the second Hayabusa has gone to visit Ryugu, uh, which has that sort of diamond shape uh, in, in the image there. We'll see that again later as we talk actually about the, the main part of this. When we talk about Osiris Rex and Bennu. So uh, we have samples from Itokawa and we will get some samples from Ryugu hopefully this year. We've also visited a number of other objects out there. Um, with asteroid Anne Frank, a uh, five kilometer asteroid, small potato shaped body uh, was uh, imaged there, look. And another comet, Comet Temple One and uh, that this was uh, studied quite extensively. But the main part of this talk is really to talk about Osiris-Rex and Bennu. And this is the picture of uh, the Osiris-Rex spacecraft with its uh, solar panels and a sampling arm sticking out the front there. Now Bennu, the target, was selected um, as a, a good target and we'll talk about why um, uh, but it didn't really have a name at that point. It had only recently been discovered in 1999. And they did one of those things where they had a public competition to come up with the name. And so thankfully they didn't come up with a sort of Bo um, Boaty McBoatface silly name for it this time. Uh, the name Bennu was suggested by a young third grade student from uh, North Carolina and with a very reasonable idea. So this, this lad, Michael Puzo, suggested Bennu because it's the name of an Egyptian mythological bird. And he rather thought that the shape of the spacecraft with its wings like that and with its uh, long arms sticking out the front uh, reminded him of some sort of wading bird or heron. And I could really see what he was uh, talking about there. And I guess the committee liked it as well. So. Um, the asteroid became known as Bennu. Now OSIRIS-REx, as with all good space missions, uh, is supposed to be an acronym, but it's one of those backronyms where they've decided uh, OSIRIS-REx would be a good name for it based on it, the fact that it was going to Bennu, which is an Egyptian bird that they've named, and uh, continuing the uh, Egyptian theme, they picked OSIRIS for the name of the spacecraft. And it's supposed to be Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer, which is very, very contrived, even for this sort of thing. 
So the primary objective of all of this was to collect a sample from Bennu um, off the surface and bring it back for analysis. So they wanted to get at least 60 grams into their, their sample container um, and again use it to try to understand a lot more about the earliest days of the solar system. Possibly even understanding the source of organic compounds that might have led to the formation of life on Earth. And we'll see why that is uh, when we start talking about what they found. So the space mission was launched September of 2016, so just over four years ago. It did an Earth slingshot gravity assist flyby uh, one year later in September 2017, and that slung it out to arrive at Bennu uh, two years ago, 3rd of December 2018. You can see the path taken in purple there by the uh, spacecraft catching up with Bennu, which is in green, and uh, the Earth there is blue. OK, so we're coming around here. Go back to the beginning. There's the launch from Earth, crosses the Earth and catches up with Bennu after another Earth encounter flyby manages to accelerate and catch up and stay with it and go into orbit. So Bennu itself orbits in that region between the Earth and Mars, although it crosses the Earth's orbit. It's a near Earth asteroid in that sense, uh, 437 day orbit around the sun, so a bit longer than our own and going a bit further out. 90% of the Earth's distance at minimum at uh, perihelion and at aphelion 135% but crossing the Earth's orbit in those two places, and those were the places used. Uh, so another little diagram of it there, uh, just showing the orbit relative to the Earth and to Mars. And you can see that uh, Bennu also goes out and, and just about meets Mars's orbit. So it's one of those bodies that's kind of uh, interacts with the Earth and also interacts with Mars under gravity and is hovering between the two. Not quite sure that that's a long term stable orbit. And it's certainly the case that these small asteroids get disturbed by uh, a process called the Yarkovsky effect. What happens is that they get hit by the sun and heated on the day side that's facing towards the sun. Um, so a lot of high energy light and uh, what have you hits the surface, the energy is absorbed in the rocks and then it re-radiates it to space as lower infrared radiation. But it doesn't cool down instantaneously, it takes time to dump the, the heat and that happens as the asteroid rotates. And so the direction in which quite a lot of the radiation leaves the asteroid is actually on the night side. And so it's getting a push in one direction from the sunlight hitting it on the day side and a different push from the infrared radiation leaving it on the uh, uh, twilight side as, as it goes into the night side, unsymmetrically. Doesn't wait till midnight to dump the heat. It uh, starts dumping it uh, most quickly, directly after sunset, of course, as the body rotates. And so it gets these two non-aligned pushes from the uh, reaction of the heat radiation leaving and the incoming solar radiation. And that creates a, a sideways push, which changes the orbit of these bodies uh, quite considerably. It affects everything, but it affects the very small bodies by far um, more significantly than the much larger ones. So it does make their orbits a little bit unpredictable. We have to allow for this and it's quite hard to calculate with any real precision. And so here is the path of Bennu relative to the Earth. So what we've done here is plotted where Bennu is in terms of direction and distance in the solar system, keeping the Earth still. 
and you can see it has from our point of view it almost seems to orbit the earth but in a very crazy manner with these strange loop the loops in it and sometimes coming very close and sometimes rather further away um, you can see the date there and in 2035 it actually appears to uh, drive straight through the middle of the blue blob of the earth you watch we've got the the, the date here so when it gets to 2035 you'll see that uh, Bennu takes a very very close inspection of the the blue dot of earth there uh, and uh, well it has quite a number of these uh, close approaches so in 2060 it's going to pass uh, 460 million miles from the earth that's not too much of a problem it'll be outside of the moon earth distance um, might be able to see it with a telescope too dim for binoculars though because it's uh, quite a small object but as shown in the orbital diagram 25 years earlier than that in 2035 so 15 years time there is uh, a slim but uh, probably unlikely chance that Bennu is going to crash into us it'll be on the 25th of September if it does so that's the point at which our orbits cross and it's predicted to come closer than the moon probably around 65,000 miles so three times the distance of the Clark Belt communications and uh, satellite TV satellites, the geostationary orbit, uh, but still only a quarter of the way to the moon. So that's going to be quite a, a, a near miss, that one. And depending upon the exact circumstances of that, and we won't know until after that flyby, assuming it misses us, um, the, to whether or not the um, orbit is going to get shifted uh, by a critical amount or not so it's going to pass by us but it will create a number of possible divergences in the orbit so that in 2175 uh, on another near approach the uh, probability of an impact goes from about one in a million to one in 24,000 chance of it hitting the earth. And if we add up all of the uh, near miss passes in the next uh, 200 years, then the chance of Bennu hitting the earth is only one in 2,700, which is uh, worryingly high. And that's where the security, the S in Os Osiris Rex in the middle there, why it had security in there, they're quite concerned about studying exactly what's going on with Bennu um, and characterizing its orbit as accurately as possible. Uh, Clive's just joined us. Hi, Clive. Um, Hi. So uh, we're just talking about Bennu, the target asteroid for this OSIRIS-REx mission, and how there's a slim possibility that it's going to uh, actually come so close to the earth that it might hit us at some point now oh. fortunately it's only 500 meters across it's still big enough to uh, weigh a billion tons and release the energy of a thousand h-bombs but it is smaller than the asteroid that uh, destroyed the uh, um, dinosaurs so uh, there's some chance that if it does hit some people might survive but it would make a terrific mess. This is why we're so interested in this particular one from a security point of view. But from a science and um, uh, chemistry point of view, we're very interested in it as well because it's a, called a C-type asteroid, carbonaceous, lots of carbon, very, very dark in color. It only re reflects about 0.4% of the light that hits it. It's almost coal black, actually. Um, and rather unusual for the inner part of the solar system. We tend to find these carbonaceous asteroids much further out. The image there, the little animated image, is a radar picture of it that was taken on a previous close pass by the Goldstone Radio Telescope, sending out a radar beam and trying to make an image of it. 
So before the OSIRIS-REx mission, this was the best image that we had of this uh, interesting and potentially dangerous op flying object. But OSIRIS-REx, as I said, it arrived in 2018. This was the approach shot when it first managed to image its quarry. There's a few stars there, but the green circle helpfully picks out the moving object, which was Bennu, as uh, the spacecraft was homing in on it. And going back to that Goldstone ra radio image for a moment, they uh, had an idea from the radio data. They'd made a computerized model of Bennu with this rather curious flattened shape with a ridge around the center that almost looks like a sort of rounded off cube um, rather than being perfectly round. So very strange indeed. Um, and they were remarkably close because once OSIRIS-REx got there, it produced this animated video of the target rotating. So you can see it has that uh, rather squarer than uh, normal shape. Of course, these little asteroids don't have very much gravity at all. They don't have enough gravity to crush the rocks that they're made of in their core. So they are just piled up as a rubble pile and they don't um, create the pressure and temperature inside themselves to crush and melt uh, the uh, core into a sort of liquid or even semi-liquid uh, plastic state. So they're not really very uh, capable of pulling themselves into a perfect sphere or anything much like that. And you can see that in the pictures because there are some spectacularly large boulders on the surface. You see them as they go around the limb. There's one come into view. Look at it, it's absolutely enormous. And you see it as it goes around the limb again here. Just how big it is, it's just sat on the surface. So that's probably another small asteroid that has just bumped and, and, and sat there. So why did they choose Bennu apart from the earth crossing aspect, which A makes it dangerous, but B makes it relatively easy to catch and visit? Well, this carbonaceous nature of it makes it very, very interesting from a chemistry point of view. And uh, it's a time capsule because we think it's very, very old and hasn't undergone that melting process that recycles the material and rubs out the evidence of the early history. Um, so uh, samples would be in uh, almost original condition straight from the uh, solar system factory. Now it's spinning here, it's rotating as you can see, it spins in 4.9 hours, which is quite fast. And that's possibly responsible for that sort of equatorial ridge that it's got because uh, the centrifugal force is going to encourage the rocks on the surface to roll down from the poles out to the, uh, the build, build a higher hump around the uh, thing's middle. And it's spinning faster. This was a discovery by uh, Osiris Rex. It's getting faster in its rotation by one second every hundred years, which doesn't sound like much. But again, that's powered by a version of the Yarkovsky effect of it being heated on one side and cooled at an angle on the other side, which serves to spin it up as well as uh, changing its orbit around the sun. Here's a fantastic picture of it zoomed in and you can see that rubble pile effect um, with the boulders all over the surface there. Um, one or two pits in the surface just looks like uh, uh, powdered concrete almost with great lumps in it. I said some of those uh, boulders are up to 60 meters across. And when they started studying it, they found some very interesting chemistry going on with uh, some of those boulders, which uh, we'll talk about in a moment as well. But because Bennu crosses the Earth's orbit twice a year, uh, particularly around the 25th of September, we get a few fragments that have become dislodged from Bennu that fall into the Earth's atmosphere and create Bennu's own private meteor shower. I thought that was rather an interesting uh, development. They discovered that that happens. It leaves bits of itself 
that uh, along its orbit and they get swept up into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and it's confirmed because uh, they were they, not only were they going to crash into Bennu and collect a sample, but they discovered on close approach that Bennu was shooting back at them and all this debris cloud was floating around near it. Um, so they had to be a little bit careful with the spacecraft because uh, high, high speed impact with one of these uh, uh, space rocks floating around the outside would do them no good at all. Um, it was uh, the uh, chief investigator, Dante Loretta, that uh, came up with the idea of Bennu shooting back and said, we are regularly seeing Bennu eject material to outer space. And uh, they were presenting that at a science conference in Texas just recently. So the results so far, fascinating first point is they discovered that some of the boulders are made of uh, very heavily hydrated material, phyllosilicates, so a metal with uh, uh, Si2O5 um, silicate anion and uh, a lot of water attached. So there's a terrific amount of water on Bennu. Um, and also they found that some of the uh, boulders that were on the surface have veins of carbonate running through them up to a meter wide. Now carbonate is something that as far as we know is only ever formed by precipitation out of hot water as the water evaporates a bit like you get in the Dead Sea and uh, in hot springs the minerals are evaporated from hot water and it definitely doesn't come from cold water and it certainly has to come from uh, liquid water deposition. So these veins of carbonate tell us that there must have been liquid water and, and indeed hot or warm liquid water for the uh, them to have formed. And what this is pointing to is that Bennu is in fact perhaps and indeed probably part of a larger planetoid that was destroyed early on in the uh, formation of the solar system. So perhaps 10 million years after the uh, majority of the solar system had formed, there was an enormous collision between two baby planets and uh, that they were destroyed and the fragments scattered all over the place and Bennu is one of them. And the original progenitor would have been perhaps um, large enough to be called a dwarf planet, a uh, several hundred kilometers in diameter, uh, maybe two, three, four, five, six hundred kilometers even, and to have had conditions with running water on the surface, um, which is quite interesting fact in its own right. And if, in fact, Bennu turns out to be part of a family of asteroids that probably all come from the destruction of this original planetoid. Um, some of the larger elements are called asteroid Nisa at 113 kilometers uh, along its long axis. This is a radar synthesized image of Nisa. We haven't had a probe go there yet. Uh, Polania at uh, 55 kilometers, Eulalia at 19 kilometers, and indeed Ryugu that is only 865 meters across, so much smaller, which was the target of Hyobusa 2 that we're hopefully getting samples of in uh, December of this year. And of course, we're also going to get, we, we think Bennu at 500 and some meters is part of this same uh, collection of fragments that all came from the original um, single object that was destroyed. And this image here over to the right, lower right, that is Ryugu, not Bennu. Um, and if I hadn't told you that, I think you would have probably thought that was another picture of the same uh, rendition of asteroid Bennu. But it's Ryugu and it looks remarkably the same with that, uh, that sort of cuboid um, rounded cornered cube aspect to it. So quite interesting. This is a real close up now of the surface of Bennu taken by Osiris-Rex zooming in and looking for potential landing sites. 
I think they picked about eight different landing sites and gave them all birds names. And in the end, they decided to go for the uh, site they called Nightingale. So this is a wide angle shot um, taken from just one mile above the surface um, and a couple of possible landing sites there. So on having chosen the site, they did indeed make the landing. And you have to bear in mind this incredibly delicate maneuver because a little asteroid like Bennu has a tiny gravity. And so trying to sort of maneuver around it, you have to be uh, quite clever uh, about your use of thrusters to uh, not bump into it too hard um, and not to miss it completely either. So on the 20th of October, touchdown. There's the probe sticking out the front and boom, and it bounced off, of course, because uh, there was nothing to keep it there. But it kicked up a whole cloud of material here all over the place from the impact. And the idea was that the probe would kick that dust and, and gravel and what have you up and it would be collected inside the um, sample container and they were hoping for at least 60 grams in the sample container. Now I just love the way this is covered in gaffer tape all around here so it's high-tech space gaffer tape I imagine probably much more expensive than the stuff that we uh, have in our sheds but nevertheless uh, it looks to have been taped up doesn't it. So hopefully we're going to get the uh, samples from this one back um, 24th of September 2023 so we've got to wait uh, just over three years or just under three years now to uh, get it back. So there's the uh, the moment just before impact of the probe just to tie that up last frame before it kicked up material for you. And I said the aim was 60 grams. Um, unfortunately, they were massively successful and the container was so full of material they couldn't shut the lid. They couldn't get the lid shut on the uh, container which was a bit of a worry because it meant that the chance of this thing being able to get back to Earth and re-enter without spilling it all was uh, very low indeed. But they have now managed to do that. They successfully uh, were able to uh, jiggle it around and get the lid shut. And they've got a whole two kilograms of material, so massively more successful than they were hoping to be. After the uh, final main slide of this presentation was a shock discovery. Some of the chunks, these bright chunks that are littered around on this, the otherwise very dark surface of Bennu, turn out to be fragments of the asteroid Vesta. They've been blasted off Vesta and landed on Bennu and uh, you can see them in those enlargements there. Now we know they're from Vesta because we've got bits of Vesta on Earth that came down as uh, meteorites and, and uh, we've analyzed those in the lab. Plus we've also had the Dawn spacecraft go and spent a long time in orbit around the asteroid Vesta. Um, Vesta's got an absolutely enormous crater on it called Rio Silva, which uh, was the subject of one of these uh, planetoid level collisions that blasted fragments of uh, material out across the solar system and a, a goodly proportion of the meteorites that we we picked up on Earth turn out to have come from that collision uh, from the collision of some larger of some large object with uh, the 500 kilometers of uh, asteroid Vesta nearly destroying Vesta in the process I would add and so I hope that we get these samples back from uh, uh, Bennu. I hope we get some bits of Vesta back that have been sat on Bennu because the only ones we've actually got here have been picked up uh, um, on Earth and identified afterwards and thereby subject to that degree of earthly interference and uh, um, contamination. 
well set. There's a meteorite on the ground. Uh, but uh, anyway, we should get those back. And also, of course, we're going to get the Hyobusa 2 uh, samples back with any luck from the sister asteroid, part of the same group from Ryugu. Um, and it'd be very interesting to be able to compare and contrast the two and try and understand even more about the history of them. Now, I've got just a couple of moments left. I've got a couple of extra slides for you here. Um, some of these interstellar grains that we've collected under the electron microscope here have this amazing uh, structure with lots and lots of nooks and crannies in the surface. And this is fascinating from the point of view of um, a chemist because it means that they turn out to be very, very good uh, chemical factories for complex molecules. All those little nooks and crannies, they uh, end up being shaded um, and so cooler than the directly uh, lit parts of the grain where the sunlight can get at the things. And so being a little bit colder, they act as a cold trap and molecules, volatile molecules especially, can get trapped in them. And then the molecules can react with each other encouraged to do so by the chemistry of the surface and the uh, little nooks and crannies are excellent for doing those sorts of catalysis and building up more and more complex molecules. And so these rubble pile asteroids with their space grains on them um, tend to be quite rich in uh, the lighter volatile materials like water and various carbon compounds especially in the case of Bennu, with its C-type nature, its highly uh, carbon-rich nature. And they're excellent chemical factories for producing all sorts of um, complex organic molecules. And it's exactly that, when rained down onto a planet like the Earth, that uh, can be the seeds of the, and the trigger for the uh, evolution of life. So getting some of these back into the lab unmolested will be very, very important. There's another little diagram of um, that process there. The ultraviolet light catalyzes molecules to be split up, but then they recombine inside the grains, inside the nooks and crannies in a very uh, uh, much a sort of means of building up more complicated structures. So I'll bring that to a halt.